All right, so um, while we're waiting for our panelists, I will say um, welcome to Profound Conversations. Today's topic is maintaining clarity in wellness during crisis. And the question that we're gonna be asking today is will we see a post-traumatic pandemic syndrome? Um, profound, con profound Conversation is a listening and discussion space which brings thought leaders into conversation for them to grapple with challenges of our time. Um, our goal with Profound Conversation is to use intercultural dialogue and community and organizational engage engagement to achieve valuable cultural, education, economic, and policy outcomes. Now, today is our third episode. Um, so we're very proud to have gone three weeks in a row with Profound Conversations. We got very positive feedback from the first two, and I'm trusting that this, this one is also going to be engaging. Our first episode was around managing mental health and wellness during um, turbulent times. The real wealth is good health, kindness, and compassion. I know some of you may have attended that, that session. And at the end of that session, um, I raised the question about whether or not we will see post-traumatic pand pandemic syndrome. And my guess is that we will. But we have two mental health professionals that's going to be with us today that can better answer that question for you. So I'm going to defer to them. And, and Dr. Bossi actually had some prep because she was our speaker for our first profound conversation. And I gave her a heads up that when we invite her back, we'll be asking her to address that issue. So Dr. Bossi, I hope you are ready to have yes. that discussion. <laughs> great, great. Um, also, um, we're, we will have with us um, Latif Rashid, and we're very excited to have him as well because we wanted to have him for the first session, but he was not available. So we have the opportunity to bring Dr. Abbasi and Latif Rashid together for this, for this conversation. And we're, you know, we think this is a really, really important conversation and an important time to be having this conversation because we are in some very uncertain times. We are experiencing financial challenges, health challenges. We have fears about today and we have fears about tomorrow. And many of our families are in crisis as, you know, some of the unresolved issues start to bubble to the top now that we're in this crisis. As um, Dr. Abbasi told us two weeks ago, um, domestic violence is on the rise. And we know that our first responders, our healthcare professionals are seeing a lot of pain and suffering. They're watching people die without the presence of the family being able to be there because the hospitals are on, on lockdown and not allowing families to come into the rooms. Um, we also, there, those um, healthcare professionals are having to make some unimaginable choices around who lives and who dies. Um, sometimes there's very little guidance around the standards, around the standards of care. So today, our final conversation, um, we hope to get some understanding from our, from our profound conversationalist around some of the best ways for us to share empathy, for us to maintain our own personal wellness and clarity in these times, and how do we prepare for what Muslim Life Planning Institute has named the post-pandemic, post-traumatic pandemic syndrome that we believe that many of us will experience. Mm -hmm. So we're gonna jump in and, and I'm going to ask um, Dr. Abbasi to give, her, give us her thoughts on what she thinks about that, whether or not we will see some of this post-traumatic pandemic syndrome. Um, and thank you so much for having me back again and continuing this important conversation. Um, so last time I was doing more like a projection and anticipation that that's what we are going to see. But today we ha are, um, have the grim reality. The domestic violence numbers have gone up in the whole world. If you see the New York Times just uh, did a whole article about it to the point that the UN is bringing attention to it and making it mandatory to take care of this as an urgent crisis. 
So that said and done, we could trace it back and talk to you about what is happening. Is, is it like pandemic-induced trauma or trauma on trauma? Like if you had some previous crisis or previously, if you were being abused, is this isolation is a very scary thing because in isolation, the perpetrator becomes empowered and the victim becomes more helpless. So isolation is a tool used by, for, by perpetrators, domestic violence abusers. So now that we have this mandatory isolation in place, we are seeing both sides of it. So there are cases which already were, you know, identified risk that how do you support and protect those spouses or in, intimate relationships where we, there is a history. But then there is this situation, like you said, we are dealing with the complex uh, stress, anxiety, and trauma right now. So it could be financial, it could be health, it could be being away from loved ones or being too close to family members that you don't get along with. It could be academic, it could be so much layers to this uh, problem. Another thing that we are seeing is normally what happens that the loss happens and you are grieving. And that then starts your grief process and then comes healing, right? Right now, it's like this trauma is extending. It's like an anticipatory grief. We are getting this every day, bit by bit, bit by bit. So you brought a very important point and I wanna correlate both the situations. So those of us who are in forefront of it, like when we see numbers, like we just had a psychiatrist scheduled, the first psychiatrist to die due to COVID-19 virus. But we have like 700 people in Detroit, mental, sorry, uh, uh, health workers, uh, COVID-19 positive, or numbers are uh, um, going up. Or you see resident deaths, or you see physicians, nurses, um, bus drivers, police force, everybody is uh, getting affected and impacted by it. So what happens is what we call is compassionate fatigue. Compassionate fatigue happens when you get exposed to this persistent trauma. Signs of compassionate fatigue can be just physical, mental exhaustion, irritability, anger, frustration, um, guilt, uh, having more negative thoughts, uh, difficulty going to work, feeling overwhelmed. And then when you see people dying, like you said, people dying and not able to be, see their families or loved ones, that gives you a guilt, like survival guilt, or the guilt that because we as providers forget that we are bearers of pain. We bear the pain with our patients, but we cannot totally, we are not in control of the outcome. So it, it's a really nice book that says, we can be God players, like after God, yes, we are in forefront, we are dealing with life and death, but we are not God. So the ultimate outcome is not in our hand, but when we see people we are caring for dying, we have this innate sense of helplessness and, and hopelessness that starts seeping into our own personal lives. So if we do not become cognizant of this, do not take care of it, it starts to seep into our personal lives. It can go into our professional lives. It can affect us individually, affect our relationships, affect so much society around us. That compassionate fatigue leads to burnout. We have high burnt out rates, but another phenomena that happens is vicarious trauma. That is trauma by association or secondary trauma, which does present as PTSD. So you will get same things, like you can have nightmares, you will have flashbacks, you will uh, avoid situations, 
you will become overwhelmed easily, you are a hyper alert. So this is, this is what is going to lead to what you are referring to is post-pandemic traumatic stress disorder. But what happens with vicarious trauma, it is hard for you to continue to perform your duty, to live happily, or to continue healthy relationships. So one sign can be high levels of irritability, anger, and frustration, which again makes a sense for us to see an increase in intimate partner violence. So we are bring, bringing frustrations, anger, and it could be, you could be in a health field right now, you could be in a, like a police officer, a firefighter, or anyone in forefront of it, feeling all these symptoms without taking a break, without taking an internal um, assessment of where we are right now, and unconsciously. They are consciously doing some abusers, doing it consciously with intent, but there could be an act of uh, omission, unconscious, without intention realizing that we are bringing all that stress home and taking it out on the vulnerable around us that could be spouse, that could be kids, or that could be animals. Wow. Um, Latif joined us, so... Um... I will ask, I'm going to get you right in here, Latif. <laughs> and Latif works with a lot, um, he works with first responders. So he is the psychotherapy with the, um, help me out here, fire department and, right. and ESM. Which county is that? EMS, yeah, it's, uh, Maryland in uh, Prince George's County. Mm. Okay. So um, Latif, we're talking about just some of the, some of the trauma that people are experiencing now and also what they may um, experience post this pandemic. And I know in your work with working with first responders, they're out there on the front line right now. So exactly. um, what, have you, what have you been seeing in terms of what some of the first responders has been, have been experiencing? Well, I think overall, I think overall that uh, not just first responders, but people are pretty much resilient. I mean, they're having uh, symptomology now, uh, as, this, as the doctor just referenced. But I think most of it is going to come, uh, it's like the proverbial waiting for the of the shoe to drop. I think uh, in the aftermath, that's when we'll see a spiking, a real spiking in terms of symptoms, in terms of uh, mental health issues right now, those are pretty much, I think, pretty much contained. People for certain have cabin fever. I mean, I'm talking about people in general and that uh, whether that's first responders or uh, which is a, a police, fire, uh, corrections, military, I think they're all pretty much doing a pretty brave job given the situation, but the time we should be much more weary of, uh, weary of, is in, in after the uh, cessation, quote unquote, cessation of the trauma and uh, the pandemic. And so, yeah, pretty much. But the other thing is that persons, the screen proves. I didn't know if he was in profound thought or if we. <laughs> <laughs> <Me? laughs> um, I think we are having a little bit of um, technical issues here. Now, now we know that everyone's home using the internet, so this is a little bit more challenge in terms of in terms of the connectivity. So, um, Doctor Doctor Bossi, let me let me ask you this while we're waiting for um, Latif to to reconnect. Have you been working with, have you had um, patients who are first responders, who are healthcare professionals that you've actually done some one-on-one -on -one work with since you started? Um, so, so far, no, um, because um, I'm basically right now working at a Jiro psych unit at McLaren Hospital and also uh, through Michigan State University doing my outpatient clinic. Um, 
But we just start, we have just started to uh, compile a task force, mental health task force, under Mayor of Lansing's um, uh, office, and uh, we intend to bring all the all these uh, different uh, um, services together to assess the trauma, the need, and to see how we can uh, share resources and uh, come up with a plan that uh, kind of be proactive uh, to the anticipatory pandemic of mental illnesses that we will see. Um, Latif, we lost you for a moment. Oh, okay. okay. Where did I get lost? Oh, where <laughs> <laughs> in the I'm very found. big I'm name. Lost, but now I'm found. I mean, I don't know the I don't know the whole song, but uh, I think it starts like that. Uh, we know that everybody was at home with cabin fever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, is there is there any um, recommendations that you have for 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 the listeners today that people some steps that people could start to take to look at protecting their mental well-being and to help them possibly avoid that impact that we say is possibly going to come, and that's that post-traumatic um, syndrome. Well, I think, first of all, it's, the, it's verbiage language. Uh, I think the, when we use the expression mental health, it's, uh, besides it being, quote, unquote, stigmatizing, that uh, it puts people more so in an alarm state. So uh, we're really looking at behavioral health. How are they behaving in the context of, of what's going on? So looking at the behaviors, and when we look at behaviors, we're not looking at quote unquote therapizing people at this juncture. That may come later on if it need, if it need be. But right now we're looking at uh, just the uh, making sure people have their regular needs. People are tethered or anchored or grounded to just being able to uh, uh, do some regular things. Uh, the most one of the most important things is getting sleep and saying, so how are people sleeping? That's, that's one of the primary things people want to know. Uh, are they having early awakenings? Are they having uh, uh, delayed onset of sleep? I mean, uh, those kind of things we can address initially uh, besides sleep. Are they having any uh, physiological uh, issues like gustatory issues? They're having problems eating or are they having uh, problems eliminating, problems eating, problems el eliminating? Those are peculi peculiarly uh, of concern at this juncture. Um, so I would start in, in that regard. I mean, are they using substances? Uh, whether or not, it's not about halal and haram. I mean, it is, but it's not, you know I mean, in terms of the context. Are they uh, using substances? They may have had, been free of substance use. I mean, alcohol, drugs, or whatever, uh, some time ago. But this onset of not knowing how to respond to the stimulus or distress of the situation may take them back to using illicit drugs or alcohol. So we want to address those kind of issues right now to try to see, okay, well, how can they move from an, a, a quote unquote maladaptive response to the issue towards an adaptive one? What can they do adaptively? So one of the things they can do adaptively is movement, uh, I mean, everyone has heard about the fight, flight, or freeze, but the when there's an onset of a particular trauma or um, a threat or a uh, scare of any sort, but in the, in that response, there's also embedded therein a a a remedy of sorts. People need to be moving. One of the things about trauma is the fact that people feel locked in, locked down. They can't move. Movement is is uh, therapeutically recommended pe for people to move, and I think that's what we see. And we might wonder why is not everybody staying staying at home? But some people just got to get out. I mean, while it may be against the um, recommendations of the CDC and the like, but people need to have movement. 
uh, when people have emotions, an emotion I read somewhere, it comes from a French word, which means to get out or to move. Like, uh, likewise, we need to have movement, you know what I'm saying? And movement, it doesn't need to be a, a, a marathon race or a bicycle chase or whatever like that, but it has to be mindfully engaging. So um, just one thing, uh, I do understand when we use the word mental health, um, that it kind of, uh, kind of is a red flag for most people, comes out with stigma. So we can hide it and say behavioral medicine or behavioral health, but I have a simple question for you. You say you are focusing on very like behaviors, right? appetite, sleep, but every behavior is controlled by a thought in your mind. So sure. behavior, emotion, thought. So yes, I know you have to start superficial, but until unless you take it to the deep down, what thought is triggering this behavior, we will not see right outcomes. So I do agree with the movement, but sometimes it's the mind that needs to be expanded. So one way I look at it, maybe we can't use mental health. We can call, start, we have, we start, we have started calling it behavioral health or wellness. We are talking wellness. Wellness yep. does not just come from physical health, the no, mental health and physical health both come together, right? So one thing I feel is very important. This is a, can be a very teachable moment for all of us and a, a kind of um, unveiling of the stigma moment um, where we all have to come and embrace it and use this moment to talk as a, as a whole person. The, uh, like you, you can't separate appetite from being sad. You can't separate sleep from being anxious. So until unless, like you said, you are not looking at therapizing, but I think it is very important to bring somebody to create those safe spaces. So one thing is physical movement, but you also need that emotional support centers. And I mean, uh, I personally think this is the moment where we can really bring it together and really go to what we are seeing, the health disparities, the health inequalities is impacting this virus more, right? And the health disparities, how are they coming out? Not only in physical health elements, but also emotional health elements, mental health elements. So there is a difference. We are not talking mental illness. We are talking mental health and wellness. Right. I. I pretty much agree with you and my licensure I'm a licensed mental health therapist right uh, that's my license right However, uh, I'd not be forthcoming but and say when people hear mental health they it's a panic, <laughs> a panic. Exactly. so I'm trying to make myself more friendly you know I'm saying I'm to be <laughs> right. a friendly behavioral therapist you know what I mean that's like oh okay you know that's more welcoming I mean right I uh, agree but I do have a, a theory I mean it hasn't been I mean it's piecemeal from other disciplines but I think a lot of the underlining conditions I mean first of all there should be universal health care but that's the side point but regarding underlying health conditions uh, particularly in certain populations within America and we know who they are I tend, I tend to trace those back to, uh, uh, you know, historical genetic issues. You know, right. So when people speak in code words, we're not talking about the history of uh, enslavement of, of right. people, you know what I mean, of the decimation of their culture, of their language. You know what I mean, those things would be traumatizing to most people. And Intergenerational the trauma. The historical, the historical impact of that has not been quieted, has not been put to rest. You know saying that still lives alive. So, uh, matter of fact, some of the one is one primary uh, premier therapist, uh, Bessel van der Kolk, Doctor Bessel van der Kolk, right. Kolk yeah, talked yeah. about the loss of uh, the instinct of purpose. Right. That people who are severely traumatized can lose the instinct of purpose. To purpose, right. 
So when we look at people uh, bereft of, of direction, bereft of meaning in their lives, uh, and it's more than just an occasional thing amongst a certain population, it has right. prevalence, you have to start wondering, is, is the, are these people just as the uh, assertion is shifty and, shifty and lazy, or has something really happened to them to, to, under, to undermine or undergird their being humane or human? We so letting those people off the right. Off, I mean. You know the trauma-informed care is you never say what is wrong with you, but what wrong happened to you. Right, right. That it, is the. But that, but even acknowledging that in terms of what's happened to us, uh, there's no, it's no, no coincidence that there is a significant. They need hypertension. I, I right. have hypertension myself. You know what I mean. And some of this, some of the traumas, as we know, we can speak about, but there are traumas, there are unknown traumas that people have lost, lost cognition of. There's something wrong, they know it's happened, but they, can't, they have no language for it. It happened, it happened maybe uh, pre-birth pre you know, of some sort. So these historical trauma, these historical wrongs are registered in terms of kidney issues, liver disorders and spleen disorders oh. that are that are legion in the African American and uh, Latino communities and Native American communities for sure. Suicidality, homicidality, Absolutely. Chronic, uh, Aggression. Chronic alcohol, alcoholism. So right. those situations are reflective, are, 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 are the offspring of the traumatization, of the discrimination, of the oppression and re, uh, rep repression that they've suffered. Right. And th that's why I feel this is the moment we, we, for the longest in this country, have dealt with Band-Aid solutions. We try and go with the symptom. We never go to the underlying disease, which is the socioeconomic, cultural um, disparities the inequalities that are still very prevalent in the country. And now this pandemic is showing us the outcome of that. But that's why I think it is important when we talk of trauma, you talk about, so we know the study of, from adverse childhood experience, which um, actually uh, I just found out none of their subjects were uh, from a minority race or um, uh, any colored people. People of uh, sorry, people of colored were included in that adverse childhood experiences survey. But still, the survey says that those who have been traumatized, their lifespan can be shortened by ten to fifteen right. years. That's right, and so, predispose them to predispose them to addiction. I'm saying predispose them to hypertension, predispose them to domestic violence. I mean, it's it's an it's an amazing study, and those are the ACE ACE factors: adverse childhood experiences. Let me so, add, sorry, go ahead, go ahead, sorry, go ahead. That, um, adverse childhood experiences, because I would imagine that some of the um, attendees on the call have children. And this is an experience that children are also going through. I, I had a conversation with a friend of mine who said that his seven-year-old was having trouble coping. And the seven-year-old actually requested counseling. Hmm. Uh, because he had an understanding of what was happening, also being separated from his friends and being in the house. So knowing what you know about, you know, the adverse childhood experiences, how do you think this whole experience is going to impact this younger generation? And, and is there anything that, that some of the parents or grandparents can do that may be listening to this that could help the children who have to go through this? That's validation, validation, validation. So we definitely are going to be, there is going to be a pre-COVID era and a post-COVID, post-COVID-19 era. We don't know what the world would look like, what the world is going to look like for these children. I can just tell you one thing, that kids these days are so much smarter. They have so much information on their hand. They have so much exposure that we have to step away from the fact that they are kids. They are, they, it's good right now to have these conversation and deal with them as a person. 
irrespective of the age. I, I responded to a domestic violence um, a call and uh, was sitting with the kids uh, four and six years old. And the, the way those kids were talking to me and the way they responded, like it wasn't a four-year-old. You, you mature, you grow up. When you face adversity, your, your innocence and naivety is the first victim. So I think important thing is validating them, communicating with them, listening to them, assuring them, and do whatever resources is needed to help them through this. I see most of our parents come out with this, what's wrong, why are you acting this way? You have these games, you have videos, you, you can do this, you can do that, you have so much, look at other people. That is okay, but that's not the right response. Exactly, yeah. I think one of the things about trauma we need to uh, recall, think about or consider Trauma is a rupture, uh, oftentimes it's an attachment rush, uh, rupture. So in terms of, and, and, and the fact that those children that you spoke of uh, have been using another expression, adultified, they speak like young adults. I mean, that is, that's an, in, a, um, on some, in some regards, people take pride in that. My, my, my child is so much, they grown, they're not like a little kid or whatever, but we're looking at it in the wrong way. Has something happened to make them so uh, uh, not children, uh, you know? Has something happened? Are they imitating their environment? I think most of the kids uh, will, yeah. or, will, I mean, because kids are like copy machines, you know what I mean? They copy mm -hmm. the behaviors around them. I mean, right. And that, to the degree that the, that the adults are in the home, that they're regulating the atmosphere with calm or with, with chaos, the children are gonna pick up on that. They're gonna feed into it. Right. So if right. it's a chaotic atmosphere, I mean, we're gonna quiet them down with a video game that's more than chaotic, you know what I'm saying? That's, you know, I don't know, I don't play video games, but in any case. <laughs> Neither do I. <laughs> it's, a false, it's a false comforter. It's a false comforter to think that we can we can put to bed or we can quiet them down with something that activates their, uh, you know, their cortisol, you know what I mean? The, the release of cortisol in them so they become hyperactive, not less agitated or less irritated. So that's, that's unfortunate. But overall, I think that, yeah, it, it really depends on how we are very in, attending. Uh, all kids need to have three, have to have three things, a feeling of significance, security, and safety. And mm -hmm. when they know that they are safe, and safety is not just, you know, the doors are locked or whatever. Safety is a visceral experience. It's from within. <clears throat> Do they feel safe? Do they feel threatened? I'm saying, or, I mean, is there, a, is there the potentiality of abandonment? I'm saying because their parents can't parent them anymore for whatever reason, you know what I'm saying, or can't care for them sufficiently for whatever reason. Those are the things that I think we really need to be on watch for and uh, pray and be prayerful that they don't impact our families, our, our communities and the like. But the sense of community is important. Community coming together, a sense of touch, embracing. Uh, Van der Kolk talks about the importance of big role contact, you know what I'm saying, the importance of hugging, for instance. Mm -hmm. Hugging is therapeutic. Well, well, now it's a, it's a <laughs> but if situation. it's a safe environment, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, you would think so. Now I can carry my hug around and threaten people. I mean, yeah. <laughs> you know? But uh, mm -hmm. hugging, hugging is a is a um, it's a warm exercise in compassion. Mm -hmm. It's an expression of caring. I'm saying it's just in, and it gives a communication of you belong. This is a time where people don't feel belonging. Uh, people feel isolated and the like, not just kids, but also adults. Everybody would literally need a hug. I mean, if that would be able for us to do that, but uh, at this juncture, but nonetheless, so 
a sense of safety, security, and significance. Those are the things that our children need. So uh, building on that, another interesting thing that trauma does, so all this vagueness, we don't have a finality to the situation. All this vagueness, unpredictability, a lot of us are going like, or, and especially being exposed to trauma, something uh, happens which is called depersonalization. Yeah. You, you can't absorb the reality, so you start disconnecting from the reality. And for the kids also, it must be so perplexing, confusing, uh, like what is going on? Suddenly they can't go out and play, can't connect with their friends, uh, they can't go to their grandparents. So it's a, it's a moment of real confusion. So making it like, and some people become very protective that they shouldn't uh, get uh, exposed to news, maybe not to television, but break, let them know, educate them in your own way. And uh, in, like, uh, do share the facts with them and do share your own anxiety also in a healthy way that yes, it's not only you, we all are feeling stress and we can all do something about it. Visibility, assurance, validity, all this is very important. Right, all that's important and as much as possible to, to have a sense of routine yeah, structure. Routine. routine is structure. Structure is control. And while we don't have control of what's happening around us, can we control the household? Can we have a quiet time? I mean, I mean, there's excitement and everything. Can we turn off the TV at a certain time during the day or evening or whatever? Can we sing some songs or read, read some books or pray together, or make dua together, meditate together? Uh, that, but the so, exercise control of the environment is critical. Critical. So another very good point right now is control is not controlling. Control is not controlling. <laughs> so I, I love that. <laughs> it's yeah. like control is healthy discipline, structure is healthy. But if you try to control, like you feel like I have to control everything, that is not healthy. That's from physiology, how it becomes pathology and controlling. Right. Whenever you try to control another human being, that's the beginning of your abuse in some way or form or shape. So be aware of that. Right. When people are out of control, they become obsessed with controlling others. You know what I mean, and controlling their environment. So that's right on, uh, is exactly right on. And people get really frustrated when they can't predict outcomes, they can't predict their significant other's behavior or their response. So that exacerbates their need to control, to have control over others. But really they're saying, I'm out of control. Mm -hmm. So um, those of you who that are um, attendees, we're gonna open the line up in a little while for questions. So think about your questions. You can either um, type them in the chat and um, Erica, if the chat is not open for them, if you could do that. Um, also you could, raise your hand and we can respond that way. But I do have, I have another question that, um, so I'm gonna start the questions out with this one is, you know, when we talk about kind of the full cycle of dealing with this, dealing with this pandemic, one of the realities that some of us are facing is that we're gonna lose people. Mm -hmm. And um, we're either gonna lose people as a result of the pandemic, or we're gonna lose people just during this time of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And I know, and I'll share a, um, a personal story, is that um, one of my um, closest friends um, had a heart attack um, a few days ago when she's on a respirator. And, and it's a really difficult period because one is the questions about how long will she be kept on a respirator? Second is family cannot go to see her. So even that normal of just trying to assess like, what do you do? Um, do you continue life, not continue life? You can't be connected. Thinking about, I can't, you can't visit the person. You know, the funerals are not possible, that those are gonna be, you know, they're limiting them to, to 10. So all of the usual ways that you have in order to um, go through the grieving process have been taken away. Mm -hmm. And how does, so this is, 
I'm also asking from a personal standpoint, but, but how, how should we, how, what are some things that we could do to help us through that process when all of the normal things that we normally do is not in place? So it's like the fire started remotely and it's getting closer and closer. So all of us are feeling the intensity and heat of it. To me, just reading about psych a psychiatrist losing uh, his life um, is getting closer to me, colleagues, family, friends. So unfortunately, even if we go with Kubler-Ross grieving process from um, denial, avoidance, anger, bargaining, and acceptance, we don't have the luxury right now. And it's... Again, the finality is not there. So we are feeling an immediate loss, but we also don't know if it has ended for us. So, you know, the exposure to danger, stress, it's, if it's limited, you know, okay, it's going to end. But right now, it's just so much vagueness around it. I think still the basic rules of self-care has to apply how much harder it is, the more the need to do it. Self-care means whatever your way of self-care is. If helping, talking to friends, family, I see a lot of this stories being shared on social media, which is even strangers putting like, God bless your family or my heart is going up we are kind of hoarding that kind of uh, uh, prayers and wishes. It's uh, self-soothing. So keeping those connections, talking to people you care or talking to, uh, again, uh, using therapy, uh, meditation, praying. If you are a person uh, of a, a particular faith, then praying, uh, spirituality, um, and focusing on what positive still is happening in your life. It would be harder to do, but I was reading like a gratitude journal. Maybe this is the time to keep one. It is like every day I will pick one thing to be thankful for. So like, you know, we say the maximum things could be better, but things could be worse. And I think we need to continue to focus on what is still working, is still intact, or what can still be protected and salvaged rather than our losses. And if you need to acknowledge the grief, cry, feel sad, it is okay. Take time out to sit down, cry, um, celebrate the lost, the person that you have lost. To think about their legacy. Think about what, uh, what they achieved in their lives and what they were not able to achieve in their lives. What were the goals that were not met? If they have left immediate families that need care, there are so many ways we can still virtually care for each other. Send flowers, send financial support, food. We can still continue to do that. So it's going to be a new way of doing things, but there is pretty much using same principles of self-care and self-preservation, just innovating it to the new reality. Thank you. I know that. Thank you. It's very helpful for me. Thank you. Um, Latif, I have a, um, a related question for you. Um, some of the stories that we've heard in terms of nurses um, I was reading one story where a nurse said that it, that every day she goes she goes home and cries. Yeah. Um, sometimes she cries because of what she's seen. Sometimes she cries because she's exhausted. Um, sometimes she cries because of the difficult choice that she had to make and that may have impacted who lives and who dies. So if I were, if you think about, um, if I were a you know, one of these individuals that had to make these decisions. And sometimes, you know, it's the same thing with the um, first responders where they're dealing with that. 
um, what kind of advice would you, um, Latif, give to them as they're kind of struggling with these challenges? I mean, the, it's a very horrible situation in that regard. Uh, and the stories that reach me and reach everybody in terms of the uh, hospitals and the ERs and the operating rooms and <clears throat> the medical personnel being just just awash in and trying to try to care, you know what I mean, and trying to be at their be on their A game, exhausted, uh not equipped uh protectively, not uh being able to rotate out sufficiently, working extended hours. It's an unenviable situation and that in better times that uh, person could you know create some distance i mean and uh but those persons uh i mean the doctor can speak about that but those persons have they're exhausted they are emotionally exhausted psychologically exhausted it's called compassion fatigue i mean uh which is real it's the, mm -hmm. it's the exhaustion that comes from caring caring about others and caring for others there are some people we need to care about and there are other, others we need to care for but in this kind of, kind of situation these persons reference in your referencing family and friends and loved ones can't come by so whether it's the nursing staff or the medical I mean, the doctors or whatever are a an unwilling substitute in many cases I can imagine. I mean, so in terms of caring for ourselves, like the doctor said, is you know, doing those doing those uh you may not we may not think there are important connections, but expressions of compassion, you know what I mean, expressions of concern uh to them, uh to the families, to their loved ones, how can we assist them? Well, we can we can pray for them. There's been literature about if seven people. I mean, I don't know to what degree, but if seven people pray for you, that mm -hmm. that has had an appreciable impact. Mm -hmm. I don't know if in this situation. Mm -hmm. I think the other thing is that that not to switch the focus, but you know, we're we're all living as a brother was using an expression. We're all living on the verge. There's an expression or a saying by Imam Ali alayhi salam says that live this life as if you're going to live forever but live for the hereafter as if you're going to die tomorrow tomorrow that that ambivalence it's it's a state of ambivalence of possibility i might be here tomorrow and i might not be here but we have this false consciousness that i'll be here forever i mean and i think that that's that myth that that preoccupation or obsession with that myth exacerbates our responses to trauma and loss when they when we are when we meet them or when they're brought to our awareness we have an over we have an over response but if we live in that state of of being on the edge constant possibility not only think that it will be humanizing for us or or uh, sobering for us but it'll also increase our humanity possibly make us much more inclined towards being compassionate and tolerant and giving to others. I would like to add one very important uh, rule of self-care, being aware of our own limitations. Absolutely. So I read something really beautiful a few days back. Your ego is writing checks that your body cannot cash. Mm. So as practicing Muslims, people of faith, our natural instinct is to reach out, to give the most. And we are all feeling this need right now to do more and to kind of volunteer. So if you are a nurse, you might be taking more shifts or forced to take more shifts. Being cognizant of your limitation that you can get tired too, you can get burnt out too. And the symptoms that we both talked about to look out for, take the breaks, step away from trauma, step away, create a distance from that and be cognizant that you did the best you could do. In the end, the outcome is not in our hand. 
we will be in death is inevitable we will be surrounded by death this is a profession we chose to be around life and death and this is heightened the sense is heightened right now but to be cognizant of the reality create a step backwards take few minutes to yourself de-stress meditate or deep breathing because we start to breathe shallow deep breathing clear your mind and focus on what is possible but one important thing is not to put so much ex don't expect that much from yourself so make sure you and one thing like you said the sleep 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 you have to make sure you are sleeping okay you have to make sure you are eating okay so if you are a caregiver more so the reason that you take care of yourself like you know the the cliche thing in planes that when the plane goes down and the oxygen mask drop you are supposed to put it on your face first even if you are sitting next to a child so that's the thing we have to practice right now that if you are a caregiver start taking it starts with you taking care of yourself and be careful of, of for physical and emotional burnout out exactly uh, does anybody um, if anyone on the call um, has any questions you can raise your hand and eric i don't um you opened up the chat line in case anyone wants to type anything in yep yep we're listening so yeah uh, the chat or uh the q a at the top so one other thing is writing writing can be really helpful um, journaling yeah. painting painting coloring um so continue to indulge in that it's not you might feel like these are selfish acts i don't have time right now to do that these are not selfish this is self caring if you need to exercise take a warm bath take extra time um drinking your cup of tea whatever it is small small things that you can do for yourself are as important as taking care of others yeah i think i think your line is open yeah can you hear me now yes yep yep go okay. ahead angela uh, first of all, I'd like to thank each and every one of you because this has really been something that um, was really needed in, in, in our country right now. It's very, it's very daunting to feel like you have to navigate this alone. And, you know, we really do need community leaders and professionals to guide us and help us guide those that need guiding. So I, from the bottom of my heart, I'd like to thank um, each and every one of you for your efforts, um, for just putting on the, the, these webinars. My question was, are you going to provide links for the other two um, that happened uh, previously for the people that weren't able to attend them live? Um, and do you have, uh, suggestion of further reading that we might be able to do specifically for teenagers who may be experiencing um, stress and struggles but may not be as verbal. Um, the younger kids you can hug and you can kiss and reassure, but teenagers tend to seclude right. themselves or sequester into their own spaces and try and deal with things or maybe even talk to their friends. So do you have suggestions specifically to how we can um, kind of help them before they verbalize that they need help? Thank you. So, what, so what, again, let me just answer the easy question. Yes, we can make the recordings available. Um, and if you register, we'll have your email and we'll send that out to you. Thank so you. maybe this is a question for um, uh, you actually is if we provide you resources, you can put it along with the recordings, right? We can. Yes. Um, yes. So yes, definitely we can add resources, but I just want to take this moment that I hope you are aware that Michigan now has a mental uh, health uh, crisis helpline and every city has a number that you can call. These are, um, then you, there are national crisis hotlines that you can call and just simply talk. 
Uh, there are virtual spaces, support groups um, available. So we will try and compile these resources uh, and uh, hopefully then can be posted along with the webinars. Yes, we can do that. Thank you. Um, I know we're at the um, top of the hour. It's, it's three o'clock. But if there's any other questions, if the panelists have a couple of more minutes, I'll um, ask them to come on and answer the questions. If anyone has to drop off of the recording, we will make the recording available. Okay. Um, is there any final question? All right. So I will ask um, in a few seconds if Dr. Abbasi and, and um, Latif wants to give any final thoughts to everyone? So my final thought is that being alone, not necessarily have to be lonely. That if we have social distancing does not need to translate into social isolation. There are a lot of ways that we can still continue. And I think one thing that you talked about, teenagers, grown-ups, parents, whoever, children, we all are feeling this need. It's natural when we get anxious, depressed, we need to tend to keep things inside of us. And I think this is a moment to really communicate, be visible, communicate, talk to people. Um, the, there is phone, phones available, you have uh, FaceTime, you have, so there's virtually so many resources that you can still connect to people. And please, please, please do not hesitate to ask for help. This is the time to speak up, talk about your emotions. Please do not hesitate, use these crisis line, use the resources around you. And uh, my advice to those of us who are kind of in forefront uh, making these policies is we need to bring mental health, mental wellness, resilience in this conversation. No policy right now, no um, program would work if we tend to focus just on one aspect of our health and neglect the other. Three golden rules I always go with is education, empathy, and engagement. And we, I think those three have to be the ingredients in whatever initiative we go forward with. Mashallah. I agree. And uh, I think, you know, perspective, I mean, it's overwhelming. <clears throat> Mostly everyone has been overwhelmed, but I think we should constantly remember that, that Allah is al muhid I'm saying, he is the all encompassing there's no occurrence, no situation, no un, an incident or critical incident that out ex, it goes beyond his expansive rahma, his expansive compassion, his expansive power, I'm saying, as well as his awareness. So I think that there, to keep things in perspective, that our sense of trauma, being traumatized or being stressed is overwhelming but we can delight, dilute that in the realization that Allah is Rahman, Allah is Latif, Allah is Al-Wadud, the loving, and that that is real. That's not just imaginary, but for ourselves to be kind, as the sister said, uh, to be kind to ourselves and be kind to each other. I mean, and to remember, as we know in Quran, it said, Allah bin dhikrullahi ta'man al doesn't the remembrance of Allah quell the hearts. Remembering Allah often, remembering Allah in this situation often, and us being very expressive about that. I'm not trying to, uh, uh, I guess you call it evangelize or anything like that, but nonetheless, that from, from our, the center of our, of our values, which is our faith tradition, that from there comes a lot of strength. I'm saying from there comes our strength. And that in this situation, as someone really recently said, we oftentimes say only when faced with death or hear the news of a death do we say, inna lillahi wa inna ilahi mm. However, 
we're all in a state of movement because the I the I yet start with a lot talking about loss of property, loss of wealth, and loss of lives. All of that, in any time we we should remember Allah to, to that we're close to Him, that He has breathed into us. He said He's closer to us than our jugular veins. That's how, so we're not alone. We're not alone. It may seem to be that way, but we're not alone. But the sense of community, as the sister uh, spoke out, uh, reference, uh, email or phone calls or whatever, that is even documentation that through, not just through physical touch or physical hugging, but through initiating communication, it activates our parasympathetic uh, uh, neural mm -hmm. nervous system. That's amazing. I mean, it's amazing to me, maybe other people. Mm. But to me, I'm amazed. And I mean, so in terms of we can do things that are extensions are, are, are extensions of our desire to, to touch, our desire to hug and embrace. We can't do it right now, but we can do it virtually with the intention. The Hadith says that Allah will judge, will, will judge every behavior by its intention. You can, we can make prayer limited by, by space or circumstance or illness. We can imagine ourselves praying. It's, it's, not, it's, it's not a far-fetched thing to imagine us being in, in Juma together and being in Jama'at together, being connected in that regard. But we have to really be thankful for the options that we do have and the fact that we have a center and that center is the center of our hope, you know what I mean? And our health, that's our sin, a source of refreshment, of anchoring ourselves, of, of our spiritual tradition and exercise of realities, even at the time of emergency like this. Wow, thank you. Thank you. Can Thanks. I extend an invite to <laughs> Latif to please come and uh, participate with Muslim Mental Health Conference? We need you there. Okay. <laughs> well, if somebody can take me through the technology. Maybe I'll, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm having a technological me meltdown, so uh, mm -hmm. that might be helpful. But thank you so much, sister. I really appreciate you all's work in Michigan, and uh, to, uh, admire that. And I need to, I need to get my magazine subscription because I've been a little uh, resistant for just forget <laughs> that. Forget. <laughs> thank you so much for what you do, Masada. Thank right. you. Same, same to you. Thank More. you. Both. Stay safe. Uh, and thanks everyone for joining our third episode of Profound Conversations.